we, we come to the, Cam the Cambridge period. I mean, many outsiders always associate the Cambridge history of China for some reason as having a direct link with either scholars who work at Cambridge, who have been at Cambridge, um, but of course we know that multiple volumes of the Cambridge history of China have been conceived elsewhere. Yeah. But this particular one has a close Cambridge connection in the sense that of course you were both physically working on it together here for a significant time you know, as co-editors. Uh, at what point did you decide the time was right you know, to literally spend you know, the few months together and, and, and really well, we had to manage to fit Ned's teaching program. We're talking in the 90s, but then I retired, so I was, I had no mm -hmm. inhibitions on this one. Yeah. We had to plan it to fit your programs, mm -hmm. and I suppose we did it optimistically. So, yeah. down in 95, we must have done to make arrangements possible in Claire Hall and everything. It must have been mm -hmm. 95. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a recollection of this period as a graduate student. Um, you know, at Clare Hall and obviously bumping into you now and then, Michael, and sometimes seeing you and then, you know, I would get some feedback and it was usually in the sort of, in the form of, <coughs> so, so what chapter, you know, what's happening, you know, how far are you into the process? And then you would say, uh, <coughs> uh, we're doing, we're doing Western Joe this week. Or <laughs> well, we really, our time was limited, as we jolly well knew, and mm -hmm. uh, we were. Clamble at that time had rooms in Benyon's Court. Benyon's Court, mm -hmm. opposite Churchill College. Right. We worked there. We were pretty well disciplined mm -hmm. shelves on which write. Each chapter had its slot. Right at its different stages and we just worked through systematically. Did you did you sort of divide tasks or how did you go about did they, each of you take a number of chapters as prime lead and then No, I, that's not my recollection. We uh, my recollection is we tried to work through in the order of the chapter that the chapters were going to appear mm -hmm. in the book, but we couldn't in all cases because some of the chapters hadn't come in. Um, I, I remember Jessica's chapter was very late in coming in, so that, that got pushed back probably even into the summer. Uh, but um, no, I think, I think we, would, we would spend evenings preparing for the next morning and Michael would show up at my apartment. Mm -hmm. um, and since, since I was just there for three months, I didn't have anything else. So they had all these bookcases, and the only thing on the bookcases were was the you know, content, these right. these chapters that had mm -hmm. come in, mm -hmm. and we sat side by side, going through. Both of us would have read the the material mm -hmm. in advance. I'm not sure that we met every day. Maybe maybe three days a week. Oh, my recollection was we afternoons, you know, we did our own business in the mornings, perhaps the preparatory work, and then had sessions in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd each read the chapter, made our own comments, first thing compare mm -hmm. them. Is it a good chapter? Is it acceptable? Right. And then we would just work through it almost through. page by page. Mm -hmm. uh -huh bringing up yes. and seeing uh, what the consequences would be. Okay, doesn't cover such and such here, well, mm -hmm. the devil's doing it. And so. Yeah, yeah. So you haven't really preconceived of, of the volume as one that, you know, that would need a strong editorial hand or that, wasn't, that hadn't, the intention was to to, to to let it all flower and then see, yes. see what you yes. got. In fact, I, I think quite the opposite. We didn't want to impose a strong editorial mm -hmm. and we, we wanted to get the best people in the field mm -hmm. and they certainly weren't going to listen to us uh, in terms of what, what they should include and what they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. we, you know, that's why we had the meeting at Star and Rock to, uh, 
to, to let everyone have a sense of what everyone else regarded mm -hmm. as, as important. We were obliged in one or two cases mm -hmm. to crack a whip, I do remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, my, my recollection of cracking the whip is that it was always counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, that it, uh, it didn't result in yeah. anything. So, yeah, do you it, remember? Do you remember getting anyone to? I remember considerable changes we had to make yes. in one trap time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and, and do I name it or not? Um, there, there were a couple of chapters in yeah, which we undertook right. yes. changes. Yeah, yes. um, in one case, I remember that the the author thanked us profusely for mm -hmm. having done so. Mm -hmm. um, in another case, uh, he was quite he was quite angry. Yeah. Um, uh, that was my own teacher, David Nivison. Yeah. Um, I remember in one case changing changing a phrasing that he had. Um, uh, he said something like, um, it's like a small terrier worrying a bone. And I <laughs> said, this doesn't, you know, this may have made sense to somebody growing up in Maine in the 1920s. It doesn't make any sense. And, and I changed it, and then he was very, very upset with me for having changed his English. The area is just brought out to the point that, all right, the style of writing in these chapters varies enormously. Yeah. Uh, David Nivison had his own style of writing, utterly different from. Oh, David keeps this uh, mm. in uh, each year, of course, the, the, we're talking about the principal chapters in the book. There was the introductory material, which the editors had to handle. Ed did the major part of the mm -hmm. introduction. Mm -hmm. And um, along the road, at that point, we realized that we needed more on climate change and that sort of thing. Yeah. And got uh, David Keatley handled mm -hmm. that for us very quickly and very successfully. Mm -hmm. were, you, were you sort of satisfied with both the range of, and, uh, of visual materials that you felt you could include in the way in which the CUP accommodated inclusion of these materials? Yes, yes, I think um, they, CUP was pretty good about that, particularly in the context of the Cambridge history, mm. which has no visual materials at all. And that's one of the things that we, we insisted with CUP, that this was going to be kind of of the Cambridge history, but not in the Cambridge history, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed us to do a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, and most important was to incorporate the visual materials. Mm -hmm. and minor things like we changed from Wade Giles to Pinion Romanization. Yeah. Uh, so those changes, CUP was, was accommodating at the outset. And one of the other things that we were able to do uh, is rather than using photographs, which of course are more expensive, and we did. And so mm -hmm. Jessica's, Jessica's chapter, for instance, is chock full of photos, but we also used um, uh, line drawings. And we were able to find a guy in, in Shanxi uh, the, the Shanxi Institute of Archaeology named Li Xiaoding. No, it can't be Li Xiaoding. This is I, Li, Li something. Li Xiaoding, of course, is a great paleographer. Li. He's probably the name must be done somewhere in the introduction uh, of a, a preface. But he, he did beautiful line drawings for us in, in no time at all. He, he's done some of just that work for one word Calco, I think. Uh, yeah, so oh, he yeah. was very well trained. Yeah. In I think maybe Bob Bagley introduced us to him. <coughs> and, uh, and that got us over a copyright problem, too. Yeah. The Chinese authorities, if I've got the figures right, said yes, well, yes, this is an academic book. This You're not writing this just for profit. So we'll reduce our charges. Mm -hmm. 
uh, instead of two hundred dollars copyright yeah. fee for a single illustration, we'll reduce it to one hundred. Mm -hmm. There are about thirty of these. Cambridge Press didn't quite like the idea of three thousand dollars copyright yeah. fees, yeah. and yeah. this. I was just going to ask because you know volumes like this that in the present day, I mean they they cost a significant amount of money to produce and just clearing copyright for illustrations and so on. Yeah. So it, we, this is actually a low budget kind of production. Yeah. If I, if I... We, we had the great good fortune that the, the government of China only signed the International Copyright Convention at the beginning of 1994. So anything prior to that was, was in the yeah. public domain. Yeah. So it was only the most recent things that we had mm -hmm. to we had to get copyright for it. Yeah. And, and as Michael says, using line drawings that we, <coughs> that we paid to have prepared. Mm -hmm. And in the label you say, after yeah, such a short. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, 15 years on, if you sort of, I mean, everybody who writes always has second thoughts or self-evaluates or self-criticizes over a period of time. If you now look back at the volume, if you have done it all, or if, is, this a is this a volume that you still sort of, that's still pretty active for you personally, or is it just one of these things, we've, we, we did it, it's, it, it's out there, and, and it's not much part of your, you know, whatever your teaching curriculum, or the sort of, the type of literature that you refer to in your own, in your own publications. How do you, how well, do you sort of sell it? Well, much more of its day to day, importance yeah. than mine. Um, in a way, I would say I've shelved it up to a point I have because I've been concentrating on other material. Yeah. But of course there it is, uh, as one's own intellectual background mm -hmm. and um, valuable for one's purposes. Yeah. But it, uh, you must sort of had a much closer. Well, I, I don't. I wouldn't say that that I refer to it on a, a daily basis by any means. Uh, in fact, I think I had shelved it for a long time, and uh, and then, beginning about two years ago, uh, I had repeated. Well, so there have been repeated requests in China to get it translated. Yeah. Um, and Li Shuqin bought the copyright for the Institute of History almost as soon as the book was published. Mm -hmm. And he organized a group of scholars in Beijing to uh, a group of young scholars to translate it. My understanding is that they did so, he looked at it and, and wasn't satisfied. Mm -hmm. After a few years, he then went to a group of scholars in Anhui and asked them to translate it. And they, they simply never finished the job. Mm -hmm. uh, in about 2006 or so, uh, I was in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a little later than the 2007, 8. Uh, and Guji, Shanghai Guji Chubansha in Shanghai, was was very desirous of doing a translation, uh, and they they came up with an idea that well their first idea was that I should translate it myself. Mm -hmm. now, no, that's not that's not in the cards. Um, the second idea was that each one of these contributors teaching in major uh, American or English universities. Yeah would have Chinese graduate students, sure. and couldn't they get a graduate student to do the translation mm -hmm. of their chapter when they could work together? Mm -hmm. That sounded like a reasonable solution to me, so I, uh, I, I wrote to, uh, to all the contributors, um, the 13 of them who survived, and uh, proposed this, mm -hmm. and said, but it will only work if, if, if you know, I said, Unanimity is probably too high a standard yeah. to shoot for, but we'd have to have close to, yeah. to unanimity. Um, and we 
came very, very far short mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Um, Xu Zhuiyun responded that this is a silly idea. There's no need to translate this book. The mm -hmm. Why would Chinese scholars want to read it? Mm -hmm. I don't know why they would want to, but they yeah. do want to. Yeah. Um, some others, Bill Moltz, resisted the idea saying that his work has always been misinterpreted by Chinese scholars. Mm -hmm. um, surprisingly enough, the most enthusiastic person uh, was Bob Bagley. Right. Very surprising. He, mm -hmm. he, he came right back and said, yes, this is a great idea. Right. Uh, but in the end, out of the 13, maybe, maybe 11 responded, and I mm -hmm. think it was six on one side and five yeah. on the other, yeah. and then I said, okay, that simply won't fly. Yeah. And uh, my response to, to Shanghai Guji was that, uh, okay, I will translate the introduction, which I did and I published in uh, one of, I think, the, uh, uh, the journal, Zhong Hua Wen, Wen Shi Wen Song, that they publish. So that was published. Mm -hmm. um, then, about three years ago, I, I got a, a proposal from a professor uh, named Zhang Shui at uh, Huanan, Huanan Shifan Dashi. And she wanted to come to the States to, do, to translate the Cambridge history. Mm -hmm. As we, as we went back and forth, the year she wanted to come was a year I was not going to be in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So she went to Syracuse University in upstate New York. And she subsequently told me that she spent the year, she translated my chapter, and she started one other chapter, and didn't, she said she found it very difficult to do. Yeah. And when she went back to China, mm -hmm. she said, if, if I were to finish the whole book by myself, it would take me another 10 years or so. And my university won't give me the time. <laughs> uh, so she gave up on it. She yeah. did do my chapter. Mm -hmm. She did a good job yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, so that whole thing uh, sort of fell apart. Mm -hmm. But she invited me to give a talk at Juan Anishada. Uh, last February, mm -hmm. February of 2013. And so I did a talk uh, entitled the, uh, the Editing and Reader's Response to the Cambridge History. I see. And, uh, and as these things, you're going to find, Michael, that Roll said no one's going to listen to this, but he's probably going to put it on the internet. And someone deep in the night is going to listen to it. Uh, about a week after I did my talk, I got a letter from some publisher in Beijing suggesting that I put together a volume, yeah, just a small volume, that grows out of that talk that I yeah, did. Yeah. Uh, and, and I may well do it. Uh, I mean, going back to, I mean, I've got some bits of the Introduction and the, uh, <clears throat> the acknowledgments lying on my lap here. And, um, you, I'm, I'm going to lift. I'm going to lift a couple of sentences out there, and uh, I'll be interested in knowing whether at this point in time, this is of course you know when the fields moved on for another 15, yeah. 20 years. You know, what in your view, in your assessment of things, has changed, and you know. Would it be feasible to address some of the things that you, you weren't able, you felt you, you couldn't include at the time? And so you, 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 you mentioned rise and fall of population, impact of plagues, natural disasters, records to deal with you know, the natural world. That perpetual question, the way of life of the mm -hmm. lower strata of society. Yeah. Um, are we any closer than we were? 20 years ago, to uh, being able to make some sense out of you know, these kind of uh, reservations you had at the time. Would you be able, with the work 
those are to form a general statement. I, my own impression would be not very much further because we're still engaged in particular problems and aspects, but it may have a different view on this one. It, you know, I, uh, I gave a talk in Hong Kong recently and, and someone asked that question. You know, is this book out of date now yeah, yeah. or what would you change? Mm -hmm. And we always say that this field changes so quickly and so dramatically that, you know, five years, not to mention 15 years later, that things are going to be out mm -hmm. of date. I don't know that anything necessarily is is particularly mm -hmm. out of date, or at least more out of date than it was when it was published. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that the archaeological chapters, um, vaunted as they are by adherents of archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, are, are not with, with the possible exception of Lotar's chapter, mm -hmm. not particularly archaeological. Yeah. Uh, they, they deal with, with bronzes. Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't historians doing this work. Mm -hmm. And I, I was recently at a, uh, at a conference of archaeologists working on the Shang Dynasty. And they're doing things like looking at the isotopes of bones Mm -hmm. that will tell where the cattle were bred and you know whether they can tell what elevation. Mm -hmm. So were they close to Anyang, mm -hmm. were they upriver, were they downriver? Um, those sorts of things. And, and they're, they're doing work with the bone. Um, they've got hundreds of tons of bones. And from that, they can reconstruct the population of cattle. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and from reconstructing the population of cattle, they can then go on to reconstruct the population of the city of Anya. Mm -hmm. And there, they're suggesting that a population of 50,000 would be, would be reasonable right. for Anya, mm -hmm. which is a rather large city. Uh, and uh, those sorts of questions yeah. I don't know that they can come up with a definitive answer right now, but they're certainly asking the questions. And they didn't get asked in any of the chapters uh, yeah. of, of this book. Because yeah. with all right new techniques available now. Sure. And uh, not available then. Mm -hmm. um, but can I come back? Question of translation. I don't think Taiwan They've ever, they've ever made a bid to translate, have they? No, mm. nobody. And I understand that, and I felt very interesting actually in your sort of, uh, you know, in your assessment of what you were able to do and weren't able to do at the time, is you write, for pre imperial times, it is rare that we can individualize history in this way or put events under a microscope. In other words, we can write about the history of personalities or people or figures mm -hmm. in a way we can perhaps, you know, more for, for Chino, certainly for Han. Um, <clears throat> I felt that was an interesting statement because, I mean, for two reasons. First of all, of course, in terms of data, it is, it is slightly more difficult, but I was wondering at the same time, is it also, are we in a sense a victim of, of the way Chinese history has been written in the past that we don't think in terms of writing as if we're writing about individuals? In other words, we don't conceive of our narrative as one that we could, you know, put, you know, in, 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 in the words of or in the words of, even if, of course, we don't have an exact real record of a particular concrete person, but we have a persona and, and, and much material written about the classical Mediterranean world, struggling with the same types of issues, um, is written perhaps more in, in terms of personal voices and therefore may have appealed a little bit more to... I was wondering whether, you, you, whether that's something that... I suppose if, if you're writing about Greek history of Greece and the Greek states, you've got much more record available to that 
that sort of approach we could conceive of having. Um, in a way, we are victims of our of our sources, are we not? It, um, I wouldn't have thought myself there was any way of getting by this, mm -hmm. by this particular one. And uh, I mean, you said you, you draw a distinction, said of course it's much easier to do this, but more possible to do it for Han at the very times. And I went through my mind then and thought, well, I don't know, I've been taxing myself all these years just wondering how one can get to a right. real personality mm -hmm. even then. Yeah. But, uh, Well, um, I, I don't know if, if other readers are sufficiently attuned to voices that they can hear Michael's voice behind sentences in this um, uh, introduction yeah. or my voice. Yeah. Um, and we wrote that together, mm -hmm. but I wrote certain portions, he wrote certain mm -hmm. portions, we went back and forth. But I can always tell at a glance, you know, 15, 20 years old, yeah. whatever it is, whose sentence is which, yeah. because that which you just read mm -hmm. absolutely has Michael Lowy stamped yeah. all over it. It's not, not something that I, that I would write. Yeah, not at all sure that this is a, a compliment to me at all. If I may digress perhaps for a second, um, I did that historical novel being. I was yes, just going yes. to bring that up. Yes. I've had people say to me, oh yes, we could hear you talking through that. And I thought, well, that means it's a complete failure. I yeah, should not have been producing myself in it. Why is it a failure? If, if because uh, I wasn't showing up people. You know, there was too much of me in it. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I had the same reaction to that. Point. I mean, I agree. I mean, I was reading it. I, mean, I, 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 I could hear my Michael. Michael. Yes, this, this is, is Michael. Just, yes. Yeah. So, so this this young soldier Bing um, <laughs> is is Michael trooping off to Bletchley Park when he's nineteen. <laughs> yeah. um, what about another one? This, the, um, it's it's. Office. Only rarely can it be suggested how a major aspect of human thought or activity developed throughout uh, all the time under consideration. Uh, you know, obviously, can we it can be studied in no more than a few cases. Can a statement or a conclusion rest on statistical considerations? It's that that issue of statistics, which continues to be, you know, such an overriding paradigm also in Chinese scholarship. So if we if we can get a graph, if we can get a you know, statistics running on anything, therefore things have been have, have been proven. And the, the use of statistics, which which or, or the and the abuse of statistics or the mistrust of statistics, of course, uh, may have been partly responsible for the reticence that scholars have had to write economic histories outside of outside of the Chinese scholarly world. So we go off on a bit of a tangent on this. Sure. I've got on my table at the moment to review a book called Witchcraft and the First Confucian Empire by Liang Tsai, who was here. And I am tearing my hair. She is using statistical method in a, in a way which drives me up the wall that uh, I think is basically incorrect and useless. I've got to try and say that in polite terms. Mm -hmm. And that is for hard times. Mm -hmm. Do you know the book yourself? Yes, I do. Yeah. Would you agree with me? Oh, I think I probably would be very sympathetic to yeah. that. But all right, I mean, you, you have got more statistics mm -hmm. for the period she's talking about, which is 90 BC, that sort of thing. But even then, I think you're on very, very thin ice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Oh, uh, personally, I think she's misusing the methods, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. The same surely applies to pre-imperial times. Yeah. And I don't think we're any better off now over this aspect than we were. Do you? <sighs> where, where are statistics most employed in the Cambridge history? Uh, in Lothar's chapter. Um, and I, 
I think he puts them, he uses them to good effect. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of archaeology, there are now thousands and thousands of tombs mm -hmm. that have been reconstructed, that have been uh, excavated. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can do statistical modeling on that. But I suppose my, my response to that would be that you're still a victim of your sources that archaeology is so, in, in the Chinese context, is so overwhelmingly mortuary mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you, you, you get yeah. thousands of tombs, but you don't get very many houses. Mm -hmm. um, so what did the people do while they were alive mm -hmm. rather than when they were dead? Uh, but we were victims of our sources. Yes. Is, you, can, you can complain about that. You point it out, it's proper to point it out in an introductory chapter like this where you're saying mm -hmm. what you've done and what mm -hmm. you haven't done. But you can't change the situation. No. I mean, also, you already mentioned that in a sense, this volume was produced in the pre-digital age, both in terms of the way in which scholars tended to communicate with each other, but this is of course before uh, you know, we have this big boom explosion of materials and BG and notes on and paleographic reflections that go on to the web immediately. And, you know, one of the main differences, perhaps, between that particular period and this particular period is that there might be more of a discomfort that it is no longer able, that one is no longer able to sort of keep an overview of the enormous amount, not only the enormous amount of new materials that are being found all the time, but the enormous amount of 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 of, of studies, of of preliminary remarks and comments that people publish left and right online now, which twenty years ago mm. you probably not find print. And so do you think it is it is feasible, you know, in this sort of new age in which, you know, our sources are just out there in much higher volume and at greater speed to produce a volume like this, let's say 10, 50 years down the line. However, of course, it makes it much more difficult. Um, the very first review of the book that was written was published in uh, maybe the, the Shanghai Zaobao or something like that by a professor at uh, Shanghai Dashia named Xie Weiya. And uh, he was very upset with the book, uh, primarily because it didn't have a chapter on the Xia dynasty. Yeah. And how could you write ancient China without the, the Xia, that all Chinese scholars agree that Chinese, Chinese dynastic history began with the Xia, with Xia Shangzhou, um, so that this book, written by these Westerners, is an insult to the Chinese people, mm -hmm. and said that it's not based on Chinese scholarship. To which I say, look at the bibliography. The bibliography runs on for almost a hundred pages, mm -hmm. and probably 80% of the citations in it are to Chinese scholarship. Mm -hmm. Now. It, you know, you can always add a Chinese uh, citation in a bibliography, but, but I really do think that mm -hmm. most of the chapters were based on, uh, on the most up-to-date work that Chinese scholars are doing. Yeah. Is that still possible to do? I, I think mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Maybe Michael and I wouldn't do it now, just because mm -hmm. we've gotten older and, you know, yeah. set in our ways. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it would... Uh, it could well be that greater effort is needed at a greater time. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I also tried to organize a, uh, a kind of uh, uh, reconsideration volume yeah. uh, about two years ago, I think it was, that I, I wrote to the contributors mm -hmm. and said that I would be happy to invite them to Chicago. Um, but what I wanted to do was for each one of them to invite one younger person working in the same field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
engage in a dialogue about just that question. You know? mm -hmm. Not necessarily saying that each one of the contributors had to defend or represent mm -hmm. the, the state of the scholarship 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and the young person would come up and say, what, what we now do today? But you know, to have a, a dialogue, uh, there too, there wasn't mm -hmm. sufficient interest. There were, um, out, of, out of the 13 living contributors, um, I think only, only nine of them responded once yeah. again, maybe maybe five or six of them said yes. That is what you feel like you said. There was no point in proceeding. So I, I think the you know so whether Michael and I are still invested in this book, and <clears> probably <throat> I much more so than Michael. Yes. Yeah. Michael was just being a good trooper, yeah. trying to to save yeah. pre, uh, Cambridge University Press's ass. You know, sure. because it hadn't published this yeah. book and he yeah. stepped in. Yeah. Uh, it's my yeah. field. Uh, so, uh, but, but apparently others, others, in the f other contributors mm -hmm. are not nearly as, uh, as invested in yeah. the book. Which brings me to perhaps, you know, another question of whether, whether you care to reflect on is it where we are now, if you look back on your own research and teaching okay. careers, I mean, I belong to the generation who was extremely excited about all these developments in early China. My teachers were already, they were trained, you know, they were, they, I mean, Mao Wang Dui and, and these great finds, you know, happened obviously uh, before my days, but by, by the time I was a graduate student, you know, early China, I think, was really flourishing as a journal, you know, under initially your editorship and then Don Harper's editorship. And, and that was the sort of, the focus, and there was a fairly vibrant group of PhD students and young scholars, um, <clears throat> now 15 years onwards. Um, I'm not sure whether my impression is, is correct at all. I have the feeling that, you know, that, that getting people to commit to PhD projects in some of these fields, yeah. uh, which are highly time consuming, they require paleographical linguistic skills that take a long time to acquire. Um, that, it, that we are thinner in terms of, of, of people out there, but that might be an entirely subjective impression. I mean, would you, from where you're sitting, would you feel you would be able to commission a similar type of project, but then looking at looking at the generation of people that you've trained and, and, and taught, rather than your contemporaries or your teachers? I'm 25 years out of date to answer that question. Mm -hmm. The main, the main <laughs> obvious answer. Just, just well, answer. I, uh, I may not be twenty-five years out of date. Um, I, I think, I think I have a good sense of what the state of the field is now, and frankly, I, I think you can put your finger on it. It's uh, uh, it, to me, uh, it, there's a disconnect. Uh, so we were all. We were all very energized by Ma Wang Dui, okay? And, and I entered the field, you know, started, uh, I went to Taiwan in 1974. In 1975, Ma Wang Dui was, the, the Lao Tzu was published. And I started graduate school in 1978, and the very first issue of Ku Wenzi Yanjiu was, was mm -hmm. issued. You know, this was 1978, there was the, uh, recognition of mainland China by the American government. Uh, Deng Xiaoping came to power yeah. and the great opening. Um, and, and it was possible mm -hmm. to go to mainland China. Mm -hmm. This was this was great fun. And we talked about the, the golden age of Chinese archaeology being the 1970s. But that golden age has never stopped. <laughs> but, you know, the 1990s, then we think in terms of, of uh, textual materials, 
the 1990s in many ways far outstripped the 1970s. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just continues. Yeah. There's so much incredibly cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe that it hasn't attracted just mm -hmm. a flood of people to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it hasn't. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and, and you're right. That I think one of the things that I recall, yeah. my, I mean, so my, my own supervisor and teacher, Mark Lewis, one sort of, can't remember what, what the occasion was, but he, he suggested that, of course, the sheer volume of, of new materials that appeared yeah. over the last few decades and the very specific specialism that requires to do, to do profound work on this has sort of led a bit to a split in the field where you have groups of scholars who work on excavated materials, on new materials, and you have groups without looking at received texts in the same with the same intensity as they might be able to. And then you have, of course, people who write about Chinese religions, philosophy, thought, and so on, but mostly based, you know, on received materials. And that it is very difficult, you know, to can, to to sort of for that perhaps this is a logical outflow from the sheer boom of 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 new materials that have put themselves up there for for analysis. You know, this is this is a debate that that I had back when I was a graduate student. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was was doing my dissertation on the I Ching, but using oracle bone and bronze inscription material, and said that I wanted to I wanted to use the inscriptional material to explain the received text yeah. and use the received text to explain yeah. the inscriptional yeah. material. Uh, David Keatley was resistant to that. He said, but Ed, surely what, what we should be doing is just using the inscriptional material. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, but David, if we just use the inscriptional material, we're throwing away the, the yeah. entire literary heritage of China. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. and that's what has got us to the point where we can read mm -hmm. this uh, uh, the, this uh, excavated material, mm -hmm. and and I still feel that, and I still want to do it every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right; there's a schism in the field. There, uh, there are people who are highly critical of of combining the uh, mm -hmm. the two different types of textual evidence. Um, but it, it, you know, there are also people who are uh, critical of using textual materials of different periods. On the other hand, I think that some of the most interesting work in China takes this long duration. People see that there's a true character that preserves the form of a word mm -hmm. or a character that was used in oracle bone inscriptions yeah. Now, of course, you have to be careful of the, the problem of anachronism there. That you've got an 800 year yeah, span. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you can link up Shang oracle bone evidence and Western Zhou bronze evidence and Warring States mm -hmm. evidence, I think that's, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but you're right that in the 90s we thought that there were. Uh, there was there was a whole cohort of young people who were yeah. coming out. Um, there were conferences, and people went to conferences. And actually, you know, these you know, I'm not sure that they're always the best venues for for fruitful conversation. But big meetings like the AAS would have a number of panels, you know, where that would deal with you know with early China didn't have any sort of ism in the title of. Of the panel, and Rishi, while you have been talking, <clears throat> I've been trying to throw my memory back to the 1950s, 60s, yes. when, yes, um, I was at School of Oriental Studies, and then the great influence was, yes, the impetus was Marxist bound, even in this country right, chase out ideas. Just a few of us 
were interested still in texts, philology and bibliography. Existing as these things did so very differently from now. Um, manuscripts, of course, hardly existed, just bits and pieces of fragments. Uh, my God, what a what a Mm -hmm. an enormous difference, but mm -hmm. then, and it was before the age of conferences. Uh, we used to meet, as you know, here in Europe once every second yeah. year, and that was, my, I suppose, the one seminal conference I didn't attend to that. Still angry with School of Oriental Studies for not inviting me. This was the one on historiography of 1956. I had been appointed to their faculty of their department of history mm -hmm. when they had that conference, and they just damn well didn't invite me. So that when I arrived, people were asking questions in which I had taken no part at yes. all. Yeah. Uh, I suppose in the 50s, historiography and economic developments mm -hmm. were the main things which were being questioned. Yeah. Certain amount of attention to intellectual history uh, in the United States mm -hmm. rather than over here. Mm -hmm. On the European continent, philology at Latin, um, Herbert Franke in Munich, looking at history in a rather new way, wasn't he? Which, mm -hmm. I suppose in a way we were still in, I'm exaggerating if I say mm -hmm. we were in the Calvary and Nald era, the term, the Calvary and Pedio era. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something else that sort of struck me, if I, just looking back at the sort of, uh, obviously, it might be you more than anybody else. Uh, yeah, sort of. You've you've made it, you know, a conscientious choice to write about the ancient China for an audience that is not necessarily a specialist audience, mm. and you know, to get to get basically ancient China out you know, amongst amongst the wider leadership. Um, I mean, have you done? things left and right, Same, but, and in a sense, but at an entirely different level, you know, you could say that these Cambridge histories are, are both a record, you know, a very well-informed record uh, for scholars, but at the same time, this is an accessible text, you know, for the, you know, the intelligent reader, you yeah. know, who yeah. may not, n now in, in, today, in, in, in well, not just here in the UK, but in Europe and in certain corners of the world, you know, where research is assessed by these absurd national bodies and where, you know, the parameters of what constitutes research versus, you know, what is what is writing for the general audience or what is translation versus annotation and so on. These have become more and more important in terms of uh, assessing people's careers so that a young scholar might not necessarily be persuaded as easily to devote a great deal of his or her time on an annotated translation of a yeah. text or on a chapter in the volume such as this because he or she you know, will be told that this doesn't constitute research, that this is that this is digesting scholarship, that this is writing narrative service and so on. Um, <clears throat> is that a is that a sort of a, a pressure point that that, that you have experienced in your own careers, or is that one that you've witnessed, or have you seen any changes amongst how attractive or unattractive the proposition of writing you know, outside the box is for scholars today? I have never felt under any pressure over this mm -hmm. sort of thing. <clears throat> I have all along the road tried to keep both things both approaches going, uh, partly in reaction against the point of 
few of some senior scholars here particularly. Mm -hmm. Yes, they write their PhD thesis, it's published, it's read by six scholars, and uh, no, they don't want to have any students, they just want, <laughs> you know, there was quite a lot of that going on here yeah. in the 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. or even 70s, and I suppose quite consciously reacted against that mm -hmm. feeling that those of us in universities had other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but not everybody by any means would agree with me. I know mm -hmm. that perfectly well. Um, I, I suppose I've got a couple of reactions to that. Um, my own predecessor at the University of Chicago, so in, in the position that I created, no, no, actually, between Creel, uh, so I, I'm not in Creel's line. Actually, Don Harper has Creel's little oh, position. Uh, my line was Ed Cracky's line. But following uh, Ed Cracky's retirement, Michael Dalby mm -hmm. uh, was in that position. Michael didn't get tenure. Uh, he didn't get tenure for various reasons, mm -hmm. but one of them is that he contributed to the Cambridge History of Tom, yeah. uh, Volume 3, I believe it yeah. is, the first part. Uh, and uh, he wrote a long, long chapter for it, which of course was never published until uh, 10 yeah. years after his tenure decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, when that volume was finally published, almost everyone who contributed was either dead or out of the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's one of the things we wanted to make sure, but any, of course, any young person mm -hmm. who would be thinking of, of contributing to a volume such as this would damn well want to be sure that it was going to be published. Yeah. So that's, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. The other concern, um, and I think it may be mentioned in the, in the introduction here, but we certainly talked about it at this Star and Rock meeting, is that the people were chosen to, uh, to contribute so that they could, they could give a kind of state of the field, mm -hmm. but state of the field meaning that it's not a personal statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. They weren't to be writing primary history. Mm -hmm. We said not even secondary. Mm -hmm. What they were supposed to be doing was writing sort of tertiary history, yeah. you know, surveying things. Yeah, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. that's that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Everyone is going to have their personal mm -hmm. their personal point of view, and and we wouldn't have invited them if they didn't have a strong mm -hmm. personal point of view. Mm -hmm. But still, we wanted them to step back from that primary research mm -hmm. and take that that wider mm -hmm. view. And, and I think I think most of the people did. I, uh, um, whether this would count as scholarship or not um, today today i i don't know mm -hmm. I, I can tell you at the university of chicago i think it would yeah. count mm -hmm. yes but mm -hmm. you know if someone else is saying that oh well this is not a refereed mm -hmm. volume mm -hmm. um, it was certainly uh it was certainly a vetted volume <laughs> yeah. uh, so i i don't uh, but i I think you've put your finger once again on an important, uh, important problem in the field, uh, and whether whether young people would would regard this as, as something valuable. Or well, how how it figures on their CV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we've talked we've talked for quite a while. Um, would you, would you do it again? If you look back over that volume and the experiences, you know, and you all have your own personal experiences and time management issues and so on, but the whole process, which I mean, essentially we're talking almost about a decade here between the first seeds being planted and then the book being out in 1999. Um, <clears throat> had you known, had you known what, you know, what was involved in it? Let me answer it in a slightly different way. If I was invited now to produce volume, whichever it is, the Hunter Town volume in Cambridge history, 
I would say sorry, I'm too old, but if I was still 60, I would certainly have said yes, uh, I would go in for it again. Mm -hmm. It's uh, One learns a great deal through doing it. Uh, yes, you come out of it feeling you've done a reasonably satisfactory job, and if only we'd done something else at the same time. <laughs> No, I, I, I would undertake another venture mm -hmm. if I was not so old, but mm -hmm. I'm too old to do it now. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm too old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too old. I uh, I don't know if it was a if it was a decade out of my life. Uh, we worked on this uh, in concentrated periods. Yeah. And then other periods, we were mm -hmm. back working on our yeah, own things. Yeah. Um, we were here for three months, uh, January through March of 1996, mm -hmm. and we didn't get it all finished, which required me to come back uh, the summer of 1996. But it was very easy for me to do so mm -hmm. because um, in, in February of 1996, I gave a, a talk mm -hmm. here at the Needham Institute, and there was a delightful young Italian woman in the mm -hmm. audience who uh, uh, eventually became my wife. And, that's also uh, Cambridge and, history, though. And, uh, that's, that's also Cambridge history. That's Cambridge history. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, this, uh, what you say, decade-long investment yeah. in my time, not only produced okay. a big fat book, but it produced two little children yeah, who, who are no longer so little. But uh, <laughs> um, that was a very happy moment in my life. So, uh, uh, but could could I repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> I think my wife would have some objections. <laughs> but, well, on that note, maybe we should have a cup of coffee. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both very much. You know for. For a wonderful conversation. Thank you all. Yes. Uh, you were you asked just the right questions. Yes, if you did it.